Well, good morning. Welcome again to the Bethany Associate Reform Presbyterian Church as we gather together to worship the Lord our God on this blessed Sabbath day. Again, we give thanks to Miss Anna Rock for being with us today to uh, provide the piano. Again, we give thanks for her uh, her, her mystery to us uh, today. A couple announcements as we begin. Uh, just as a reminder, please uh, take a look at the Women of the Church announcements, especially uh, the announcement on the dues. Uh, please uh, take note of that. Also, uh, as a reminder, uh, we'll be meeting again tonight at 5.30 for Sunday night service. And uh, we're going to be starting a new series on Sunday night. Just as a reminder, uh, the Sunday night service is really uh, more of a, a fellowship time, uh, kind of less formal, if you want to use that term, uh, as the morning. And so one of the things we're doing in Sunday nights is we're uh, doing a little more instructional time, kind of learning some more about our faith. And so uh, to do that, tonight we're going to start a series talking about how God works. You know, how is it that God operates? What, he, what does he do from day to day? And where do we learn that in the Bible? So we're going to start that tonight. So, of course, invite everybody back at 5.30 p.m. for Sunday night service. And, of course, on Wednesday nights, we invite everybody out for prayer meeting and for youth group. And, again, if you have any questions about any of that stuff, just let me know. Also, uh, one other uh, note in the uh, that's not the bulletin uh, that just to pay attention to, uh, the annual Thanksgiving service. Uh, will be Wednesday, uh, uh, November 23rd at uh, 6.30 p.m. Uh, so just kind of make sure that's in your calendars as we take time to give thanks to the Lord for this year and for uh, the blessings uh, that he's bestowed upon us. So let's go ahead and prepare ourselves for worship today as we do so through a moment of silent prayer.
Amen. Our call to worship this morning comes to us from the words of the prophet Isaiah. As we turn to chapter 26, uh, verses 7 and 8. As we hear from this song of salvation, we are reminded of the way in which our people have given thanks to the Lord for thousands and thousands of years. And as we are those who carry on that tradition, that faith that has been passed down, we use these words to testify to our own faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's hear these words from Isaiah uh, chapter 26, verse 7 and 8, as we open our time together. The way of the just is uprightness, almost upright. You weigh the path of the just. Yes, in the way of your judgments, O Lord, we have waited for you. The desire of our soul is for your name and for the remembrance of you. Amen. <clears throat> Thanks be to God for the reading of His Holy Word. And let us turn now uh, to our opening Bible song as we respond to this call to worship with a word of praise. And let us go to Bible song number 256 as we sing this portion of Psalm 119. Let us stand, let us rejoice, and let us give thanks. gather together on the Lord's day in this house that God has made and provided for his covenant people. We come together because we trust in the Lord our God, because he is our all in all, and he is the one who has given unto us life eternal. And so we lift up our praises unto the heavens out of thanksgiving for his grace and his love. So let us turn now as we continue our worship in prayer. Let us pray. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the creator of the heavens and of the earth, and the God who is our strength and our song, our ever-present help in the day of need. Unto you we have come together to sing, to read your word, to lift up our needs unto the heavens themselves, 
To proclaim unto the world that you, dear God, are our hope, our comfort, and our peace. And dear God, we pray through the power of the Holy Spirit that as we consider your ways, as we meditate upon your laws, and as we are refreshed uh, by a remembrance of the gospel, that Christ is dead for sinners, sinners such as you and I. And having done this marvelous work, he has given unto us that name which is above every name, that regardless of what this world might throw at us, whatever the old man within us might tempt us to do in sin, you are the faithful God. The same God yesterday, today, and forever. And we have no reason to fear this present world. For our hope is in the world to come. And in the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is the author and the finisher of our faith. And the one unto whom we rest. Both this day and forevermore. And our God, as we lift up our prayers and as we lift up our worship this morning. God, we come now saying the words your son taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us turn now in our copies of God's holy and perfect word as we come to 1 Kings uh, chapter 5. And as we read uh, verses 10 through 18. As we close out this testimony of the way uh, that this man Hiram, king of Tyre, is used by the Lord to build his holy temple. Let's go there to 1 Kings chapter 5, beginning at verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord. Then Hiram gave Solomon cedar and cypress logs according to all his desire. And Solomon gave Hiram 20,000 cores of wheat as food for his household and 20 cores of pressed oil. Thus Solomon gave to Hiram year by year. So the Lord gave Solomon wisdom as he had promised him. And there was peace between Hiram and Solomon. And the two of them made a treaty together. Then King Solomon raised up a labor force out of all Israel. And the labor force was 30,000 men. And he sent them to Lebanon. 10,000 a month in ships. They were one month in Lebanon and two months at home. Adoniram was in charge of the labor force. Solomon had 70,000 who carried burdens and 80,000 who quarried stone in the mountains, besides 3,300 from the chiefs of Solomon's deputies, who supervised the people who labored in the work. And the king commanded them to quarry large stones, costly stones, and hewn stones to lay the foundation of the temple. So Solomon's builders, Hiram's builders, and the Gebelites quarried them, and they prepared timber and stones to build the temple. Amen. Thanks be to God for the reading of His holy and His perfect word. Please be seated. All right, well, I invite the children to come forward for a lesson today. Well, good morning, everybody. How are y'all doing today? Y'all doing well? You know, weather changed a little bit uh, from yesterday to today. You know, got a little bit colder. It kind of reminded us that, yes, it is November. You know, that little warm snap we had the past week was uh, a kind of fool's uh, summer or fool's fall, however you want to put that. But, you know, the, the leaves have all pretty much fallen off the trees and Thanksgiving and Christmas and all that stuff is 
It is closer than it is farther away. So I know it's going to be a busy time of the year for y'all. And this morning I want to talk a little bit about what we just read from 1 Kings chapter 5. Now, have any of y'all ever built a house? No, you haven't, you haven't done that yet? Well, I'm sure as you drive around Bethany and Clover and York and stuff, what do you see going on around here? They're building houses. Right, they're building houses everywhere, right? And, and does it seem like that's going to slow down? No, right? You just see projects after projects after projects. In fact, we got a couple of folks here at Bethany who work at a plant where all they do is make houses. And you think about all the stuff that goes into that. You know, now, what do you think you need to build a house? Wood. You need wood? Bricks. You need bricks? What glass. else do you need? You need glass? You know, electricity. You, you need electricity, right? You know, and once you get the house built, what do you need inside of it? Furniture, right? And also you need those little knobs that go on all the doors, right? And you need uh, all the uh, you know, appliances and all that stuff. Now, where do you think that all comes from? Lowe's. It comes from Lowe's, right? That's right, yes. Now, where, do you, where does Lowe's get? <laughs> right? Well, it got to come from somewhere, right? It doesn't just magically appear there in, in Lowe's, right? Now, now, where does the wood, do you think, come from? Comes from trees, right? And 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 then people got to cut them down, right? Then they got to got to put them on a truck, and the truck's got to take them to the plant. And the plant's got to cut them up, and then they get the loads, right? And now, how many people do you think are involved in all that? Millions. Millions of people, right? There's a lot of people involved in all that work, <laughs> so that the house can get built that you drive by all the time. Now, when we think about houses, right? We, we automatically, from what we read in 1 Kings 5, think of the Lord's house. And the Lord's house, do you think it was a small house? No, right? The temple is a big house, right? It's a place where all the, the, the elements of the worship of God can be kept. And, you know, what kind of wood do you think they used? Did they use that wood that we get at Lowe's that, that isn't quite straight and, and uh, isn't quite a two-by-four and all that stuff? No, right? What we heard and what we read is they went to the trees themselves and picked out the best trees to be used in the house of the Lord. Now, why would we want to use the best trees for the house of God? They're the best person. That's right, because God is the best, right? We, we save the best for what's most important to us. Now, nowadays, right, you know, we don't have a temple like they did in, in the Old Testament. Right? We have houses of worship like this, but you know this isn't where God dwells. Right? He doesn't live inside the, the building here at Bethany. Where, where does God live today? In heaven. Right, in heaven. And, and where else does, does he live? Everywhere. That's right, everywhere, right? And he lives in the hearts of his people. So if, if we read this story in the Old Testament of them saving the best for God, and building the best house they could build, one of the lessons we can learn from that for today is that we are to take the best of what we have, and who are we to give it to? To God, right? So when we think about our time, when we think about our energy, when we think about what we do every day, right, the best of our time and our energy should be to God, right? He should be the number one in the plans that we make, in the, in the things that we do every day, because he alone is worth all of that blessing. So as you, you make plans during the week, as you think about you know, what you want to do every day, right? who, who do you think should get the best? God. God should, right? And we do that not by the power within us, but through the dwelling of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, right? He reminds us that God is number one. Right, that he is to receive the best. Well, let's go ahead and pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for uh, the way in which you remind us in your word uh, that you are worthy of our praise. You're worthy of our time, our energy, because you have given to us more than we can imagine. You've given us your best, uh, your only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we rejoice and give thanks for these things in him. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Well, as we come together now to give our best unto the Lord in song, we turn to hymn number 537. Now, we're going to sing the first uh, three verses of 537, but I invite you to stand as we sing together, as we, again, raise our voices up to God in thanksgiving. Again, 537, take time to be holy. Rejoice in the name of our God. Let us now be seated as we bring the needs of our hearts and our lives to Him in prayer. Let us pray. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the eternal promise made unto Adam and unto Eve, and the God who has fulfilled every promise that you have ever made. For you, dear God, are alone able uh, to keep uh, those promises, because you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You are the constant one. And you are the one to be trusted, to be rested in. The one alone who is able to grant peace of soul, peace of mind, and peace of heart. For to God we look unto the world around us and we see the way in which even the strongest of things fall. Collapse under their own weight fall short of what they have said they would do. And yet, dear God, we turn back unto these idols. We turn back unto them no matter how many times they let us down. And dear God, we confess our sin before you this morning. We confess our lack of trust in your ways, in the means of your grace, and the assurances that you have provided for us in your Son, Jesus Christ. And to God, as we do think of those idols that we have made, even with our own hands, those things that we place before you, God, we pray this morning that not only would you give us eyes to see these idols for what they are, 
But dear God, that you would give us the desire, the will, the purpose to rid ourselves of these household idols made of silver and stone. But dear God, we are those who sometimes in life are as Israel. We are like sheep without a shepherd. But dear God, we are sheep who have wandered from the great shepherd. Who have looked the, the, the gift horse of salvation in the mouth and have uh, wandered into pastures which we thought were greener. But we have seen them much like the prodigal son to be but uh, the dregs of the bottle. And dear God, we pray as you open our eyes to see these truths. That we might be reminded that you are our Heavenly Father. And that you long to see the repentance of your people. And that we know that as a gracious and a merciful and a loving God. That you are like that Father. Who seeing his Son on the road runs unto him and embraces him. For that is again the kind of God that you are. Dear God, we confess once more that we have taken your mercy not only for granted, but we have used it for licentiousness. We have used it for the pleasures of the flesh. Dear God, we pray this morning that you would again give us eyes to see these things. And dear Heavenly Father, as we do again meditate upon your grace unto sinners. Dear God, we look back at the week that has passed and we see the many ways that your providence has smiled upon us even in the darkness. Now dear God, even when we have felt far away from you, you have never been far away from us. You are ever present with your people. And unto this we give thanks on this blessed Lord's day. This queen of days. Of which all other days are, are given to support. Dear God, we do pray that as we make use of this Sabbath day of rest. And as we meditate upon your works and upon your mercy. That you will strengthen us for the week that is to come. Dear God, we know that whatever steps are before us in the week uh, that, that is before us, that you will walk therein. That you will not only protect us, but that you have established those steps. And dear God, as we do think about all the things that we have planned for this next week, we pray, dear God, that we would seek your glory in them. That we would give them unto you. That we might be reminded again that the Lord Jesus worked in his life. He did the day-to-day -day things that were necessary. Whether it was working in his father's uh, carpentry house. Or whether it was when he was about his father's business. He sought to bring glory unto your name. And to God, may we learn the way of these things from our master. And may we find our peace in whatever it is that God has established for us to do. Whatever vocation that he has provided for our hands. May we work unto his glory. And may we seek to honor him and keep his commandments. Dear God, we know that uh, the day in which we live is, is becoming more and more difficult to do so. We're being asked by the world to make compromises. We're being asked by the world to deny our Savior, to keep our place. Dear God, we pray that you would provide us wisdom, that you would provide us understanding, that you would most of all 
uh, remind us that we have a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. That you have given us to one another that we might lean upon one another. And we might ask our elders or ask those mature in the faith what it is that we should do. We are not in these things by ourselves. You provided again this family of God that we may mourn with those who mourn and rejoice with those who rejoice and that we might build one another up in faith. And we give thanks for these things this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, as we do think of the body of believers here at Bethany, as we think about our particular needs as a congregation, God, we lift those up unto you this morning. We confess our sins as a, as a church. We confess the ways that, that we have not sought your glory. We pray, dear God, that as you establish us for another 225 years, that we will remain faithful, not for our own sake, but for yours. We do give thanks again for the many ways that you have used the Bethany Church over the last centuries to serve this community. God, we do lift up unto you Clover and we pray for your county. We pray uh, for the Bethany community. To God, you know the needs that surround us. You especially know those needs that are unknown to us. And we lay those especially at your feet this morning. God, we give thanks for the opportunities you provide uh, to us to minister to our neighbors. And while that, that ministry may not always take the same uh, road or may not look the same, we know that it is of you because it is done in faith. And to God, as we think about, again, uh, the, the, those uh, needs that we have, to God, we are especially drawn to see the spiritual needs of our community. God, we know that there are many around us who know not the Lord Jesus Christ. Under God, that's ultimately what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. It's to love your neighbor enough to witness Christ to them, both in the, in the words that you use and in the lives that you lead. That others might have reason to ask the hope that you have within you. God, we do pray uh, for that ministry work at Bethany that we might reach the lost for Christ. That we might open the eyes of those in need to see the grace that is offered to sinners. And dear Heavenly Father, as we continue to worship you this morning and as we think about those nearest unto us who are in need, both physically and spiritually, we pray for healing for those who need healing. We pray for renewal for those who need to be renewed in their understanding of the gospel. For you, dear God, are worth all our praise, all our honor and all our days. For you have not only given us life in body, but you have given us new life in soul through the gift of Jesus Christ. So dear God, we close our time this morning asking once more that our eyes may be upon the celestial kingdom, upon the glory that is to come, for we are pilgrims on the way. But this is not our home. Our home is in the heavenly places where we will no longer see the effects of sin, no longer deal with realities of the fall, there will be no sorrow, there will be no pain, no tears, only rejoicing and peace and praise. Help us, Lord Jesus, to see the glory of that day as we rest in you. And in his name we pray, amen.
Well, I invite you to stand as we come to the reading of our sermon text this morning, which comes to us from the fifth chapter of the book of Matthew. Uh, now, uh, this uh, uh, portion is a little bit more uh, than we have read over the last couple of months. This is three verses uh, as opposed to our usual one. So we come here uh, to Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 10 through verse 12. <clears throat> Hear the word of the Lord. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we come into these words of Holy Scripture this morning, we pray through the power of the Holy Spirit that you will open our hearts and our minds to receive your truth, and that we might not only receive your words, but place them in our heart and rest upon them both this day and forevermore. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. As Jesus has continued in this uh, uh, teaching from the Sermon on the Mount to talk about what it means to be a believer in Him, you know, He has noted several uh, activities, if you will, uh, several um, you know, kind of uh, you know, pictures of what it looks like to be a believer and what He expects of His disciples. As we know, the Sermon on the Mount was not given for a crowd who had gathered around. This was really a time of private testimony to, from Jesus to those whom he had called to be his. He was preparing them for the life that they had come to have in him. They were to expect that he was not what the Jews had expected. He was not a man who had come to reestablish the Davidic kingdom in the land. He had not come to rid the land of the Roman Empire and make the Jews great again. For he had come to do something far more important than earthly things. As we hear in this passage, the Lord Jesus Christ had come so that they would have their great reward, not in this world, but in the world to come. That heaven was the goal of the Christian life. And that heaven was the purpose, the reason for why Jesus had been born of a virgin, why he had been born in Bethlehem, why he had been made ready for a day such as this. And so as Jesus is closing up this, this portion of the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes as they have come to be known, he is reminding the disciples what they have signed up for. There is similarity between what Jesus says here and what he says to the crowds in John chapter 6. Remember there in John chapter 6, after he had fed the 5,000, the crowds are following and will not leave him alone. Remember, Jesus wants to go off to a quiet place. He wants to kind of recharge his spiritual batteries. He wants to be alone with his father. But the crowds find him and follow him. And Jesus turns to them in a way that probably is not in uh, you know, most of the outreach books that you read today, and tells the crowd, you're not seeking me for the right reason, go away. Right? That's not usually what they tell you to do you know, at business seminars about how to you know, influence people and how to you know, gain uh, followers. You don't tell people to go away. But that's what Jesus does. And it's, it, it strikes us as somewhat strange. But remember, why does Jesus do what he does in John 6? 
Because they are seeking Him for the wrong reasons. They, having their bellies filled, want to continue to have their bellies filled. They don't want to labor for food, right? They don't want to work uh, for uh, earthly things. They want Jesus just to provide it for them. And Jesus is telling them, there's a problem with seeking the bread of the world. Because when you eat bread, what happens to it? You can't eat it again. Right? You dispose of it. Your body breaks it down and you get rid of it. And it's no more worth anything. Bread also, if you don't eat it, just leave it out, what happens to it? Well, according to Jesus and according to you know, basic logic, right? You leave bread out, it spoils, it's of no use. Only to make you sick and make you die. So if you're seeking Jesus for earthly wealth, for earthly things, for earthly pleasures, then Christ is telling you here in Matthew chapter 5 to go away. Because that's not why he has come. He has not come to, 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 to take care of, you know, historical wrongs. He has not come to bring social justice upon the world. As he makes clear in this passage, Jesus Christ has come to reconcile sinners to his heavenly Father. And having reconciled Sinners to his heavenly father, they will experience what he has experienced and will experience in the future. Jesus here at the very beginning of his earthly ministry is telling the disciples, if you follow me, trouble is going to be your daily life. If you follow me, the world will seek to destroy you. If you follow after me, Satan will come daily to tempt you. Your life, instead of becoming easier, will become harder. That is the reality for disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ in accordance with what he teaches here and with what we have seen throughout Scripture. You go back and you, you look at the life of the patriarch. You go back to Abram and you see uh, what happens to Abram when he travels around. And you see that, that, that when Abram travels around, he is put in situations where he has to make a choice. And unfortunately, what do we see often Abram do? He doesn't make the right choice, does he? Right? He lies about Sarah being his wife, not once, but twice. And why is that? Because he's afraid of his own flesh. He's afraid that if the king see how beautiful Sarah is and find out that she is, or he is her uh, wife. I got my relations all mixed up there. But if they find out that she is, that he is her husband, there we go, that, that they'll kill him. Right? Because that's what you do, right? If you want somebody's wife, you kill him and you take her for yourself. So he lies to the king. And God in his mercy, what does he do? Well, he not only protects Abram, but he protects the kings as well, right? He comes to the kings and says, hey, this dude's lying to you. You need to be careful. And we see in these things, right, Abram receiving the mercy of God. But we also see something about the temptation that is natural to the heart of all men. Right? Our goal daily is to do what? protect ourselves. Right? That, that's the natural desire of man is to make sure we get what's ours, that we are protected, that we are you know, you're, you're taken care of, and we'll do whatever we need to do to ensure that. Well, Jesus here in Matthew 5, 10 through 12 is telling you, as Bob Newhart used to say, stop it. No longer consider the ways of this world. No longer understand the things of this world and seek them. For you have been given a higher calling. 
You have been given a higher vision of not only what matters, but what the goal of your life is. And if you seek that which the Lord has called you to seek, what will happen? Jesus tells us clearly. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You notice something again about what Jesus is saying here about persecution. Jesus here is not saying that if people tell you to knock it off, it's just because you're a Christian. The, the Bible is not saying that if you're rude and a believer, that people are persecuting you for telling you to, to knock it off. Right? Persecution has a very limited scope and limited focus. It is when you are doing the things of the Lord for the sake of Jesus Christ and people tell you to stop. That's what persecution is. That's what we see in the book of Acts, right? When 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 John and Peter are, are imprisoned and the Sanhedrin tells them, do not go and preach Christ and crucify. And what does Peter say in response to that? But we are to obey God rather than man. And then they go out and they preach and what happens? They get arrested again because they have sought to see and to show the world that they are unconcerned with their personal life because they've been given a calling to go and to proclaim Christ, be what it may. No matter what comes, this is what they are to do. So when we think of persecution, we think of these things, the, the, the question is, is that if we aren't being persecuted, is there a problem? And I believe that Jesus is teaching us here in Matthew 5, 10, 12. If you're not being persecuted, there is a problem. If the devil is not seeking to harm you, then he's not concerned about you. Right? If the world doesn't have a problem with the way that you live, it's because you are of the world. And if you, if you have no trouble uh, with uh, the world, that's because, again, the world has no trouble with you. And one of the things that we see in what Jesus is saying here is that the world should have a problem with you. That the world should be reviling you. The world should be chastising you. The world should be mocking you and making fun of you and uh, causing you uh, discomfort. Because who is the king of the world? The king of the world is Satan himself, right? He is the king of this world world, of this earth, of this day, of this place. And what do kings want out of their kingdom? Right? Kings want everybody in their kingdom to love the king. Right? Kings want everyone in the kingdom to serve the king. The king wants everybody in the kingdom to obey him. And what do kings do to those who disobey him? Well, they put him in prison, right? They, 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 they Take things away from them. They, you know, you know, cause uh, problems in their lives. And so the question again is: This true of you? You know, did your faith cause any problem in the world today? You know, are you unfriended by people on Facebook because you refuse to bow the knee to culture? And that may be somewhat of a silly example, but. That is what should happen if you stand up for the ways of Christ, right? People should not want to see these things. Because why? Because they don't want anything to do with what Jesus teaches in the scriptures. And so that's just a means of, uh, of that happening today. But do we, you know, kind of, you know, shade the harder edges of our faith so that nobody gets mad at us? Right? Do we, 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 we shade some of the harder uh, teaching, the harder things for this culture to accept 
in order to remain in good graces with the world. And it's a hard thing to come to grips with, right? It's a hard thing to understand because, you know, we have lived in a society, in a culture that has been not only a go-along to get-along culture, but it has been a culturally Christian culture uh, for a number of generations. Now, in the book of Judges this morning in Sabbath school, we, we, we talked a little bit about you know, what it's like to live in a culture like that. Now, the book of Judges, of course, is a book about the people of God after they have established this covenant kingdom in the land of promise. And everybody there is a Jew. Everybody there you know, is a son or daughter of Abraham. And they're in this land that God had provided. And being in that land that God had provided for them, what would you expect to see in a Christian nation uh, as Israel was in the days of the judges? You'd think everything was, was wonderful, right? That every, everybody believed in Jesus and everybody did all these things because they went to tabernacle every Saturday. They you know, did the outward things of the law. But what do we see in the book of Judges? The book of Judges is just one chapter after another of God's people being wicked, God's people destroying one another, God's people seeking the fleshly things of the world and thinking they're being rewarded because God's judgment hasn't come down. One of the ways God often brings his judgment is that he allows us to remain in our sin. He doesn't bring judgment down upon us. Right? He, 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 he allows us to, as, as the scriptures tell us, to, to, to gather up wrath for the day of judgment. And one of the reasons why we're in the situation we're in today is because our, our Christianity for generations now has been without a point. It's been uh, without the harder edges of, uh, of the truth. But we, we have so neutered the gospel and we've so neutered the law of God that the world rightfully wonders why all of a sudden we have a problem with the, the seventh commandment. When we've allowed our culture to flagrantly deny the first commandment. When we've allowed our culture to flagrantly deny the second commandment and the third commandment and the fourth commandment especially. So why do we concern ourselves with this one commandment all of a sudden? It's one of the things that Jesus is, is pointing to the Pharisees about in uh, the Sermon on the Mount. You know, later on here in chapter 5, he's going to talk about the salt of the earth. I didn't, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Right, Jesus here is describing the Christianity of his day, right? The religious Jews of his day. Their religion is worthless. Because it does not contain within itself the truth of God's word. It does not contain within itself the desire to serve the living and the true God. One of the beauties about Pharise Phariseeism is that you know, it makes us comfortable. It makes us at peace. Right? Because as long as we are doing uh, these cultural things, as long as we're doing the outward things of the law, we think everything's wonderful. But how does Jesus describe the Pharisees later on in Matthew 23? He, he describes them as whitewashed tombs. Because everything looks good on the outside, right? Everything's whitewashed, everything's beautiful, everything looks wonderful. But what are inside tombs? Right? Dead men's bones. And the reality is, is that is the church today. We are so concerned with the way things look on the outside. We're so concerned with putting on a face. And are unconcerned about what's happening in here. Right? Unconcerned with, with, with the reality of our own testimony to Christ. 
And Jesus here, as he has been laying out the Beatitudes, again, he has been pushing and pushing and pushing against, again, the religion of the age. Right? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And what does it mean to be poor in spirit? It is to recognize that we are nothing. That we are worth nothing in ourselves. But those who are poor in spirit, those who recognize that they are worth nothing, they are worth everything because they have found their worth not in their works, but in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus in the Beatitudes says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Right? Those who recognize their hunger, those who recognize their thirst, are seeking the things of Christ and being filled in the things of Christ. But if you don't know that you're hungry, if you don't know that you're thirsty, will you seek after those things? But if you're, you're comfortable, again, in an outward religion, then you're never going to be satisfied because that's not what we need. What we need is the inward work of the Holy Spirit. What we need is, again, this understanding of the nature of the faith that we have been given. And this isn't a new problem. This isn't a new issue that all of a sudden has come upon the church. This was something that Paul was concerned about in the first century. If you go back and you read every single epistle that Paul wrote, what is he worried about in these churches? He is worried about a faith which is dead. That's why you know, those who say that Paul and James are somehow in, in conflict are, are, are totally lost. Because they don't listen to what Paul says. When Paul is, is warning young Timothy at, at the end of the first epistle that he writes to him, he says, but you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I urge you in the sight of God who gives light uh, to all things before Christ Jesus who witnessed the good confession of Pontius Pilate that you keep this commandment without spot blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing. Now, what is Paul talking about here when it comes to the fleeing of these things? Well, in the previous thing, uh, portion of chapter 6, he's been warning him about seeking those things which please the ears of men. And again, to go back to Sabbath school this morning, you know, one of the things that just is amazing about Judges 17 and 18 is the fact that this, this man, Micah of Ephraim, thought if he had a Levite in the house, that everything would be great. If he could just get, you know, the, the, the holy thing and put it inside his house, that meant God would bless him. As long as he had the appearance of righteousness, the appearance of holy things, everything would be great. But what we see is, is that Micah, who had placed his faith in this idol, well, that idol is taken away from him by somebody who's stronger than he is. And instead of seeing the insanity of the situation, the foolishness of the situation, what does Micah do? He goes and makes another idol for himself to worship. And so Paul here, as he's writing to young Timothy, he's telling him, be watchful about those things that have constantly gotten the hearts of men. And that is the concern of being liked in this present evil world. This concern, this worry that somebody might actually say something mean to me if I live unto the way of Christ. That I may be persecuted for my faith. I may not be able to be involved in something. I think a lot of Christians suffer from a, a FOMO, right? You know, fear of missing out. Right? We, we see what the world is doing and we want to be part of it because that's what most people are engaged in. 
But brothers and sisters, what, what Jesus tells us here is, is that we don't want to be involved in those things. Because broad is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. And we're not meant to be the majority in this present evil world. We are to be a loud minority who is testifying that we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That we have no desire to have the things of this present evil world. But we are to find our peace in that which is not passing away. As we see Jesus, as he says here in, in Matthew verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Again, do we desire the righteousness that the word describes as righteousness? And remember, we're not seeking this righteousness for our own sake. Right? What does Jesus say? Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely. For my sake, not my sake, but, but Jesus' sake. Because again, what is the focus of the Christian life? It's not this world. The history of earth is filled with those who sought to glorify themselves. And where are they today? It's one of the things that, that God is trying to teach us in the book of Daniel as we see the giant statue built. And we see the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. And we see this statue which may, is made out of different uh, types of materials. And at the end of the dream, remember what happens. There's a mountain that shows up. And what does the mountain do? It crushes the feet of the, uh, of the statue. It destroys the statue. It does all these things. And then later on, of course, Daniel has another dream where he sees this vision of the kingdoms. Right? The kingdoms which are to come. The four kingdoms. And one kingdom rises and falls. The other kingdom rises and falls. The other kingdom rises and falls. And all these things take place. And what do we see? What is the only kingdom left standing at the end of days? It is the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Many will rise and many will fall, but one will be standing. And so the question that we have this morning, uh, the question that Jesus is asking us is, are we ready to be persecuted? Are we ready to face the reality of what's going to happen when you no longer can be involved in civil society in America? Because you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Like, and are we willing to do that? Unfortunately, most of the disciples were not. Jesus tells a story in Luke chapter 9 of uh, these men who have been called. And what do they immediately do? Say, oh, I, I have this I need to take care of. I, I have this I need to do. I, I have this which is more important than following after Christ. But what did Jesus say in Luke 9? We are to put our hands to the plow and we are not to look back. Because those things that we have given up for Christ, what are they in comparison to what we have received in Christ? What are they in comparison to the eternal life which has been given to us? Because this life that we're leading now, it's but a whisper. It's but a, a, a little whistle in the history of man. But eternity is a long time. It's forever. And we have to make the decision of what matters to us. Are we willing to gain the, the blessings of the world so that we can spend eternity in hell? That's what most people make the conscious decision to do. They would rather have the things of this world. Rather than that which is to come. But brothers and sisters, those things are, are worthless. They cannot give you what you desire out of them. And so we must be willing to be persecuted. 
We must be willing to be despised by this world. We must be willing to be made fun of by people who used to be our friends. Because Jesus is more important than all of these things. No matter the earthly cost, no matter the, the, the earthly things that we have to deal with, what are they in comparison to the joy that we have in Christ? To the peace that we have in Christ? To, to all of the blessings which come to those who rest and trust in Him? There cannot be a comparison if we try to do, you know, cost-benefit analysis with sin, we're always going to come out on the wrong side. And so as we close this morning and as we, again, think on these things and as we are challenged by these things, we need to make that decision today. We need to think upon the truth of what Christ has revealed to us. Because Jesus has not promised us a rose garden. He's not promised us an easy life. He's not promised us a smooth sailing ride from salvation to consummation. Jesus tells us that we're not above him. And what did Jesus experience? He experienced death on a cross. He experienced the abandonment. He experienced all of these things because why? Because he was about his father's business. And nothing that this world could throw at him changed that focus. Because he understood the glory that awaited him as he rose from the dead on the third day. And he ascended into heaven to sit on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From whence you come to judge the quick and the dead. That's the Jesus that has been laid out for us in the Sermon on the Mount. That has been laid out for us in the Scriptures. So why do we think that we're greater than he? Or better than he? And as you make decisions from day to day, ask yourself that question. And I'm, am I willing to lay down my life for my sake? Am I willing to be inconvenienced for my sake? Am I willing to lose the things of this world in order that I might have the things that which are to come? And brothers and sisters, we cannot do that alone. That's why corporate worship is so important. That's why corporate prayer is so important. That's why corporate fellowship is so important. Because God's given us brothers and sisters to bear with us through these things. That as we bear these things, we might say, they are nothing in comparison to what I have in my God, in his grace, in his love, in his care for me, a sinner. Saved by the blood of the Lamb. Let us pray. Righteous Heavenly Father, we give thanks again that as you remind us of what it means to be a believer, as you remind us of the consequences which will come to those who rest and trust in Christ, <coughs> that we might look upon these things and say, what of it? For what we have in eternity is more than enough. It's more than sufficient. It's greater than anything that we can imagine. For Christ is our all in all, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let us stand as we sing our closing Bible song, Bible song 269. Let us rejoice again as we sing these words of Psalm 126. <clears throat>
we close our worship this morning and as we receive the benediction from Revelation 5, verses 11 and 12, again, if you have need to speak unto me or to the elders or if you have questions about anything, we are here to serve and help in any way uh, that we can. Again, please uh, come and speak uh, if you need. Let us go now to Revelation 5, verses 11 and 12. Hear the word of the Lord. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Amen. 